Good afternoon and welcome to International Women's Day on the sofa with Taryn um, and this is for um, the organisation that we work for, Home Group. So Home Group have been celebrating International Women's Day all week, looking at the successes that women achieve in their everyday life and I think that's important because it is every day um, that we're achieving these um, aspirations, inspirations and successes. So, I think it's great that we've got a designated day to celebrate that, but not forgetting that actually it's the everyday as well. Um, I'd like to introduce our remarkable panel, uh, which is made up today of Nosheen Hussain, who's the Executive Director for Home Group, and Breed Gill, who's a Member of Parliament. So Nosheen is an Executive Director for Business Development at Home Group. She is responsible for strategy, innovation, marketing, sustainability and project management. Nasheen is also our executive lead for our colleague multicultural group and is part of our role models at Home Group. As a British Pakistani and having grown up in London, Nasheen has a very strong sense of culture. With a degree of business communications, Nasheen pursued a successful 20 year career in marketing, working in a range of industry, including publishing, financial services, energy, construction, broadcasting, and now housing. Nosheen feels passionate about continuing to make positive change in the world and more progressive mindsets and inclusive behaviours. Nosheen would like to inspire young women, and I can certainly say she's an inspiration to me, um, and give them confidence and shine with progression. And a little bit of background on uh, Breed Kaur, who is a, um, a Member of Parliament. So Breed Kaur Gill um, is from Birmingham, Edgbaston, and she's a Shadow Secretary of State for International Development and the first British Sikh female MP. Born and raised in the West Midlands, Breed was a social worker and a councillor and a cabinet member for public health and protection prior to entering Parliament. She's the chair of Cooperative Party Parliamentary Group and a patron to social housing, char charity spring housing and vice president to the local government association. In Parliament, Breed chairs all party parliamentary group for British Sikhs and co-chairs all party for international freedom of religion and all belief and West Midlands. In 2020, she was named MP of the Year for her Patchwork Foundation. So both, I have kind of worked with our colleagues within the organisation um, and put forward um, a kind of a request and a plug for questions that they would like to ask yourselves as leaders, as female leaders and fundamentally as BAME female leaders. Um, so I've got some, um, we've had an overwhelming response, I would like to say that we've had an absolute overwhelming response, um, but I've narrowed the questions down um, to a select few and I am going to kind of um, ask those questions to you as uh, individual um, panel members. So we'll start with the theme of uh, choosing to challenge because that is International Women's Day's um, Choose to Challenge for 2021. So with this theme in mind, and this is a question for Breed, um, what are the key areas you feel you should be challenged um, so that it's more equal for women? So I think, so I look, think look, it's great it's that great we're, that we're celebrating, celebrating International Women's Day and this year's theme, as you said, Taranji, is choose to challenge. Um, and it's it's really important what this actually means, because today is a reminder of just how much further we've got to go around gender parity. And we know that the pandemic is going to push many people around the world much further back in terms of poverty, in terms of social protections, job losses. 70 percent of the global health workforce is women. And, you know, when you when you look at it like that, you know, the very issues that we face here in the United Kingdom are the kind of solidarity issues that we see globally for women. But of course, in some countries, it is much, much worse because, you know, women are the ones that are having to go out to work 
um, putting themselves at risk in terms of the pandemic. You know, uh, and we see that not just here in the United Kingdom, but uh, as I said, across the world. So I don't want today to just be a day where all of us are reminded of actually how much more we've got to do to advance women, not just in the workplace, around gender pay gap, but actually women leading the conversation because actually the pandemic has disproportionately affected women not just here in the uk as i've said um but actually we all have got to ask ourselves who are we relying on to actually for you know uh challenge uh what's happening in terms of policy making decisions in terms of legislation in terms of opportunities in terms of equalities um it's got to be us so we have got to really make sure that when we see women that use their platform that use their voices that we come behind them, we support them, and actually us as women coming together, we are a force to reckon with because if we want to implement change, um, then yeah. we can do it. And it's been really heartening today to see uh, in Delhi today, you know, we've seen the solidarity of women at the fore of the farmers' protests and they'll be doing a march uh, in Delhi to, to recognise that. And again, it's been great to see people like Rihanna and Greta Thunberg who've come and shown solidarity from people, you know, around what's been going. In the future, we are going to see social movements. We must see more social movements because that's what a healthy democracy looks like. It's enabling people to have a voice um, and treating them with the greatest amount of respect. Um, so I'm really, really hopeful and encouraged that actually I want to see more women coming together, more women speaking up, not just on today. And, and, and it's a reminder for us, yes, we are here talking about International Women's Day. Yes, we are here about talking about the things that we want to change. The question we have to ask ourselves is what is going to be our role and what is going to be our responsibility and what is the one or two things that we care enough about that we are going to build a movement and build a campaign and create that change. Um, you know, the onus is on us as well. Let's not look to others to to, to lead that charge. So, so you are, are you saying that there, there's um, a key and a strength in that social movement, in plugging that social movement and standing behind that social movement? Um, in terms of that question? Absolutely, because if you think about decision making that happens on a very high level, it will take us the next 130 years to get gender parity. I mean, just yeah. imagine just that. We do not see women in those uh, positions that make decisions that will absolutely enable or bring about that kind of, um, you know, gendered response that we want to see across policy briefs, because it isn't just about women inequalities doing that piece. It's about looking at, well, how does climate impact women? How does health inequalities impact women? You know, it's about cross the board. I mean, today, um, the Labour Party, myself and Yasmin Qureshi um, in the Department for International Development team, we are um, launching our consultation about, you know, what does a gendered response to international development look like? How do we move away from just big organisations? How do we make sure that the grassroots activists, the very people on the ground that don't have a space or a voice or are not funded, how do we make sure that they are part of the conversation, they are part of the change? And as I said, social movements, I want to see more social movements um, going forward. And it's been really encouraging to see that in the pandemic because we saw the Black Lives Matters, um, you know, and now again, the farmers protest is the biggest um, protest in history. Um, we've got to continue to choose to challenge. It's not going to be the theme for this year. It's something that we as women have been doing for so many decades and we're going to continue, um, we're going to need to continue to do that. And I see, you know, in home group, I'm sure there are lots of women in your workforce um, who are affected in different ways, you know, whether it's around uh, the pay gap, whether it's about caring responsibilities, whether it's about opportunities within the sector, whether it's about qualifications and learning and all these uh, other issues that are so important. It's about recognising what is it that we can do together um, to bring about the change that we want to see in our workplaces, but also um, in our places where we live and our regions. Thank you. That's, there's lots of food for thought in that, isn't there, Breed? So, and, and I certainly think that this will kind of, we're certainly from an open um, organisation, so there's lots of, you know, food for thought, and I'm sure we'll be taking lots away from that. So I'm going to move on to my next question, because you mentioned gender pay gap, pay gap quite, uh, quite a few times in there. Um, so that's going to lead me on to a question for yourself, Nasheen. Um, the gender pay gap is still a gap. Um, what are the key actions you would feel give the most benefit in reducing or removing this? I think um, it's important that we continue to report on the gender pay gap because once you have it out there in the public domain, organisations are more likely to do something 
positive, take positive action to close that gap. Um, now, all organisations with more than 250 employees are required to report on their gender pay gap every year by March. And since the pandemic hit last year, that requirement has been suspended by government. So my pledge today as part of International Women's Day is to is for the government to reinstate that reporting, which has been further delayed now or extended, I should say, to October this year. Now, 45 percent of organisations continue to uh, voluntarily report their um, gender pay gap information, which is brilliant. And what that has shown is that this year, the gender pay gap has fallen from 17.5% to 15.5%, which is very, very positive. But what I suspect is happening is those organizations who have been proactive and have voluntarily supplied that information are the ones who generally take positive action to try and close that gap. So I think what's happened is that positive drop in, gender pay, in the gender pay gap is actually an artificial um, statistic and isn't giving us the true picture. Um, Preet has just already um, touched upon how the pandemic has impacted women and we know women have been um, suffering as a result of the pandemic and um, are one of the uh, underrepresentative groups who have been hit hard uh, by this and we know that gender pay gap has been impacted by the pandemic however the statistics aren't showing that because they're not they're not showing the true picture of, of what the gap is. So I strongly urge the government to reinstate the gender pay gap reporting, but also extend it to um, organisations with more than 100 employees uh, rather than just 250 and extend it further to report on the ethnicity pay gap as well, which we know is an issue and a, um, a you know, big disparity in the workplace. Thank you for that, Nasheed. And that's really interesting because it it makes me think about quite a lot of conversations that I've had with BAME females who are working in industries such as beauty, um, you know, and you know, or or a very very you know other industries where their um, worth or their um, their pay is not as recognised um, as other other qualifications or other um, and and COVID has certainly hit them. Um, a lot more stronger because, you know, there's issues around, um, you know, not being paid, not being paid their furlough on time, not then being able to challenge that back to the business owners. And I think that has a lot to do, again, with uh, um, the, the, the confidence around challenging gender, uh, gender pay gaps, um, has a lot to do around um, confidence in, in, in challenging per se. Um, so it's a, a, again a really interesting um, topic, and it's reassuring to know that you're, um, you know, taking steps to take that further. Um, particularly for colleagues within Home Group, I think that's really reassuring. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of move on to my next question, um, and this is a question for yourself, Breed. Um, as a woman and from the band community, what challenges have you encountered throughout your career progression? Uh, really good question. I think it's um, not just about being BAME. I think women encounter, you know, lots of barriers, you know, in the workplace. Um, and certainly mine were really no different. I remember when I was a counsellor um, and, you know, I, my daughter, my first daughter was very, very young and I subsequently had two daughters whilst I was um, working during my uh, career as a counsellor and cabinet member. Um, and I was regularly told by other um, Asian men that, you know, I should go home. I shouldn't worry myself about various things. It really wasn't for me, you know, and I, I, I clearly had other duties that I should uh, go and uh, contend to. And I think one of the things, though, is that, throughout your life you will face lots of barriers it isn't always just men it is women as well in positions of power that are you know part of that uh process of sort of um preventing you from progressing i i, I would say um and certainly you know one of the things that happened to me during uh, my career i went you know for a senior job i knew i definitely could do it um and um you know i didn't get it and i and, and i remember going to see my senior manager and saying you know can i just ask you for some feedback is there anything i'm doing wrong here and she said oh gosh that's a really good question um she said we never see the vulnerable side of you 
And I remember leaving that meeting thinking, God, what does she actually mean by by, by that sort of response? This is a really strange thing. Um, and what she really meant is that, you know, you, you hear this word being used in a lot of sectors, which is a safe pair of hands. And what, what that is, is, you know, generally what we saw is people that were never going to challenge the status quo that, you know, were just in agreement with sort of senior management, were the ones that were progressing as opposed to if you had an opinion, if you challenged, if you were outspoken, and if you had ideas and almost suddenly, you know, you get tarnished as a woman because that confidence is now perceived to be a threat or it's perceived to be, oh gosh, you know, uh, more change. And, 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 and I suppose, you know, you have to make peace with yourself in terms of, when you face some of these barriers, what, which ones are the ones that you're going to challenge? Because actually you can use so much your energy and get so disheartened um, when you're trying to fight some of these barriers, you know, these issues. And like for, for me, um, you know, I had to really take stock and think to myself, actually, I'm a, I'm, I'm really good at what I do. My data has been outstanding. Actually, I, I can prove all of these things, but this is a really bizarre situation that I'm finding myself in. I'm not being enabled and allowed um, to progress. But then I remember um, recognizing that actually I love what I do and I, I, my team love what they do. And actually the difference that we make is far greater than some of these kind of uh, politics that you see at work. And I remember coming home and speaking to my husband about it. And I, in, my, in myself, I made peace with it. I thought, you know what, it's fine, it's okay. You know, and I am now going to focus on my politics. And then can you believe uh, another door opens and I became appointed to the cabinet. And I remember going to my employer and saying, actually, I'm going to reduce my days down. And they're like, no, 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 please don't do that. Can you do these hours, but do them in your own time? And I, and I remember thinking, well, actually, I do care about what I do, and that's fine, I will do that. Um, and then when I when I stood for the seat that I, um, in Birmingham, Edgebaston in 2017, I took six weeks, um, you know, unpaid leave in order to do that. And I remember telling my um, employer, sort of four weeks into the election, saying, do you have a replacement, you know, for me? And, the, you know, my senior manager was like, well, no, because you're coming back. And I and I, I was like, sorry, I said, I'm going to win this seat. I, I'm not coming back. You need to really make sure that you've got somebody because there's no way I'm going to be able to do my notice period just because of the nature of the work. And it was things like that, you know, throughout your life that you see. But I think the important thing that I would I would say is, you know, it's it's about having support around you, people that are able to kind of guide you, find a mentor, something I always did throughout my career pathway. And I still look for mentors now because I think, it's so important as a woman to get that feedback and to sort of get somebody that understands the sort of barriers that you're facing, but can absolutely help you um, navigate some of that. Um, so I'm really pleased that, you know, I, I, I'm and, and, and interestingly, a year later, I got this uh, email from the senior manager saying how brilliant she thought I was and how ex excellent my work was. And I was really outstanding. And I remember going to speak to my manager thinking, was she wait? Did she think I was waiting for her to tell me all this? I actually knew that I actually know my own self-worth. Um, but this is really, really bizarre. And I think I'm not the only person that have got stories like that because I'm sure everybody has got a story similar in, in that sort of situation to tell. Um, the, the lessons for me really was that I was able to find something else that I cared about and was able to make sure that I had the space to be able to do that. And there were other people that uh, enabled me to do that. So that I was very lucky in that respect that I had a, a fallback career um, and I, you know, really rethought my position. But unfortunately, this is something that we as women go through because we are taught, you know, that we should be confident, that we should excel and we should, you know, be ambitious. But the moment we do that, actually, we are labelled and we are, you know, treated in a certain way and we're almost told to go and sit back in our seats. And, and you know, th this is another thing. I remember when I went for a cabinet position, given my background with children's services, um, oh, yeah. I remember the very people that I spoke to, um, they, yes, they, you know, they said, why have you applied for this post? And I said, well, I, I've got the background. Surely you, you need my sort of skill set. They're like, no, no, no. Do, do you not know how this process works? You need to wait your place and we'll let you know when we think we're going to appoint you. So it's things like that that you're constantly facing as women, um, you know, that you then decide, actually, I'm going to challenge this issue, but I'm going to leave oh. this because this I'm not going to change this. And actually, I'm going to expend a lot of my own energy um, doing this. And it's going to just cause me pain as opposed to me actually being able to influence okay. uh, and change anything. Yeah. Thank you for that. Brie. Do you think that those challenges are heightened anymore being a BAME senior leader or being a BAME leader? 
I mean, yeah. certainly that's something that we, you know, I don't want to think it was because of that, but unfortunately it, it is because actually when you look at advancement and you're able to look at some of the data in companies, and I know Noshin talked about the gender pay gap, actually we are able to look at how many people progress to certain positions and, and you know, where they, where they're then there's a kind of ceiling as to how far they're enabled to go and they don't seem to go beyond that. And we can see that in most of the sectors. If you look at the very senior management, the director levels, there'll be very few BAME representations and there'll be very few women BAME represent, uh, representation within that. So, as I said, there's so much more for us to do, but we've got to challenge our organisations to do much better, especially when we live in demographics where there's such a diversity and choice. This idea that somehow we don't have the skill set or, you know, that we couldn't possibly do this job or, you know, actually, you know, that is not true. We've got to make sure we give people the support, the training, the development, the opportunities to be able to then uh, excel and do much, much better. Thank you. That's, uh, again, lots of conversations. Um, I loved your point about kind of um, mentoring, and that's, again, something that our um, executive director, Nasheen, is plugging, pushing, and I think developing. We're kind of developing a, um, a reverse mentoring um, within the organisation, which I think resonates a lot of what you're saying. So um, it, it's kind of reassuring for me as a as a BAME leader within the organisation, knowing that the organize, our, our organisation, Home Group, has got that viewpoint, um, but, you know, there is still lots and lots of groundwork to be done, as, no, you know, as, as Nojin can kind of um, and agree with. Um, so it's going to kind of bring me nicely on to um, the next question, which is actually open to both of you. Um, which level of your career has had the most barriers? Um, was it the hardest? Uh, was it the hardest to have equal opportunities at the beginning, the middle, or just as you were getting to the top? Preet, do you want to go first? I was going to let you go first, considering I just answered that last question. <laughs> Okay, no worries. Okay, so um, so I would um, I would most definitely say it's at when you get to that mid level, and I've been quite fortunate, or perhaps quite blasé, because I you know I'm quite hard working, and I just you know when I when I've got myself focused on something, I just I just go for it. So uh, you know I've worked very very hard, and I'm, I'm sure I haven't got to where I am by by chance. But you know, it most definitely is when you get to the mid level, and the fact that the gender pay gap widens from the age of thirty really does back this up. So the pay gap amongst managers, directors, and and senior level officials remains the greatest when we've looked at the um, age comparisons. And at entry point, when you you start your career uh, path, it's pretty much close to zero. Um, and I think it's really really important that we have male allyship within the workplace because it goes without saying that um, positions of power within organizations largely still belong to men and that's why it's really important we have that male allyship uh, for women within the workplace and the first part of what organizations should do is recognize that there is an issue in terms of gender parity within the workplace and secondly then to take positive action to fix that by supporting female career progression within the workplace Thank you. I, I was, the, yeah, the only thing that really um, I, I was going to add is that, you know, yes, women can excel and they they can become directors and prime ministers and, you know, come on the shadow cabinet, for example, or be in the cabinet as a minister. The thing that I would say, though, it is a very lonely place sometimes when you are there because this expectation that now that you've arrived at that position, you somehow know everything and you are going to perform at your very best. And then the expectation levels are really heightened, not just from those around you, but from within yourself. And I think as women, we are so judgmental in terms of the pressures that we put under our ourselves because we feel we've got to know this and we've really you know got to have in-depth knowledge on various things because surely we can't be really good if we don't do that um and you know we do this d d 
at the same time as recognising that actually we are the ones that probably assume all the domestic chores <laughs> and the caring responsibilities, as well as trying to excel yeah. and be yeah. at, at, at a level. And actually, this is not the pressure that men have when they reach that same level, because, you know, it will be very different. Although I don't want to make a, a uh, you know, a kind of generalisation on that, because I think there are lots of men where they, they absolutely accept their responsibility and they see that sort of equal partnership with their um, partner around some of this thing. But my thing is, when you get there, it's about the support you have when you get there. It's about the development. It's about the ongoing training. It's about then other opportunities, not the fact that you've got there and that's it. And there's there's nothing else, you know, for you. Um, so so I think lots of, you know, I've seen a lot of women that have reached those paces and actually they then say that they don't always get the support that they need. And then actually, you know, can sometimes be scapegoated for the very things because they're just an easy target. Um, and I think, you know, it's so important to recognise that, that yes, um, you, know, uh, you know, there are amazing women that are smashing those glass ceilings, you know, and, and doing some phenomenal things. Um, but, you know, we need much more of them. And that means that we need to be clear about what are the pathways to help women to get and excel to those places, because it can't just be for certain women uh, with certain sort of background or certain uh, contacts that they have to get into that. It's about, you know, how how is that a quality of opportunity afforded to everybody? Um, and that means it does matter where, you know, uh, adverts are placed. It does matter where you go headhunting. It does matter that you are seeking to have a diverse list of candidates when you are choosing um, to appoint people. And I, I, I suppose I say this about councils more so. It does matter that you have people that live in the cities that you are trying to shape and develop um, because actually, if you don't live there, you don't have as much of a stake, but you also don't understand the diversity or the issues that matter um, to those places. So I think, you know, it's much, much broader when you think about some of these um, challenges that uh, many organisations face uh, when uh, appointing people. Thank you. Some really interesting points that I, I, I'm, I'm taking, you know, mentally I'm making notes in my head about thinking right okay that's something that we're going to need to take away and think about as an organization really um it kind of brings me nicely on to um my next question which is for yourself breathe actually uh, is there anything individuals can do to improve their chances of getting equal opportunities or is it down to the organization's driving focus around um kind of the culture shift I think this is a great question because I think, you know, far too often we see appointments being made and people say, well, I never saw that advertised. I didn't know that opportunity was available. And, you know, this is why I say it's so important that when we are providing these opportunities, that people feel that they are accessible in their language, uh, places where they live, where they would normally go to get news, for example, you know, everybody has, you know, young people are on uh, TikTok and Instagram and various things. How do we how do we make sure that we are really, um, you know, going out of our way in terms of understanding, you know, around marketing, about um, trying to engage and who are we, who are we trying to appeal to, to apply for some of these um, jobs, uh, you know, and it can't just be that we just do the same thing we've always been doing and use the same sort of outlets. Um, we've really got to di diversify that because we know that people um, use digital uh, social media in different ways. Um, so I so I think, yes, there is, a, there is a challenge really to make sure that we are providing a quality opportunity. I mean, it isn't just the onus of the, the individual because actually, yes, you can go on Google and you can search and, you know, sometimes information is not always accurate. Um, but actually, I think it is down to organisations because, you know, if they are, if there are opportunities, how do you make sure that everybody knows that that opportunity is available? How do you know that, you know, how do you make sure that everybody has the opportunity to try and uh, apply? You know, yes, they may not succeed, but actually doing an application form is so skilling as well, because actually many people in jobs haven't done one for years and years and years. And yeah. and they, they then never think about going for another job because, you know, that seems like an arduous task. It's, it's, it's understanding, well, what are the barriers that prevent women from really, you know, uh, achieving high or making change or wanting to do something different? What are the things that actually prevent them? So how can we support them? Um, and I think good organisations will try and do that um, to make sure that, you know, uh, women have the best possible opportunities to um, apply for various jobs. Thank you. Again, quite a few points that, you know, I, th I sincerely hope as an organisation we are working towards. Um, so it's good to kind of know that that's we're on point, um, but still, again, lots of work to do around that. Um, 
<laughs> which I suppose kind of brings me on to the um, next question, which is for yourself, Nosheen. Do you think discrimination and inequalities against women have progressed in the last five to ten years in the workplace? And what can we kind of do about that? Well, the good news is it has. I'm very pleased to say so huge um, strides have been made um, in terms of equality, particularly for women in the workplace. But, you know, there's there's almost always more we can do. Um, so currently, more than two thirds of women make up our UK workforce, and that's up 50 percent since the 1970s. Um, and there's more women now in senior roles as well, which is which is great to see. So at Home Group, for example, we've um, we've done so much work around this, and uh, we've introduced the Rooney Rule, which means that we will proactively shortlist um, women um, for senior level roles, and we've extended that also to. Um, our uh, BAME candidates as well, which is fantastic. We launched a Women Into Leadership um, programme to help um, women progress within the organisation. Um, we've, we report on the gender pay gap and we were one of the organisations who continues to voluntarily report on, on the gender pay gap. Um, and, and we do mentoring, Taryn, as you've um, previously mentioned. Um, I think it's sad, though, when you look at the number of women in senior roles, for example, you know, within the FTSE 100 companies, did you know that there's just five women CEOs? And that is a stark um, and, and very disappointing statistic. Um, and at this at the current rate, as Preet said, it would take at least 80 years, certainly not within my lifetime, to get more women um, at uh, an equal rate. Um, in CEO positions as, as men. Um, and it's worth noting also that the highest pay, paid male CEO within the FTSE 100 company earns 90% more than the highest paid female CEO. So, um, you know, these statistics are really disappointing, which tell us that there's always more we can do. And if only all organisations didn't just talk about um, you know, gender parity and equality within the workplace, but actually took positive action to fix it. That's where we need to get to. Thank you. And I'm hoping with you on board, um, as with some of our other directors, we'll certainly be taking some positive action um, to move this agenda forward for Home Group. So finally, this brings me on to uh, um, the last question, which is for both of you, actually. Um, if you could go back and give your 15 year old self one bit of advice, what would that be? I, th I think so similarly to some of the things that we've been talking about around opportunities, I think I would go back to my 15 year old self and say, you know, be more bold and confident and ask the questions about actually what opportunities are available for you, what pathways are available to you, what else could you do differently? Um, I think even with career pathway choices, I mean, it, you know, yes, we had some form of careers advice when I was back at school, but it wasn't always brilliant. And you were pretty much left to figure out, you know, whether it was your parents sort of saying you should be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. I know I went through a range of um, thinking through, even when I was at university, thinking, gosh, what am I going to do with my degree? I have no idea. Um, and, and, you know, I think, again, looking back at my 15 year old self, it, I, I, I'm one of seven and I grew up with a lot of responsibility um, and, and almost felt like I never had a childhood because I had to help my mum and, you know, she, she was a machinist at home um, as well as looking after seven kids. It was really, really tough. And, and I saw her go go through a hell of a lot of that. Um, and so I think, you know, you mature very quickly um, and, you know, you don't kind of get you, you know, don't get an opportunity to really be uh, a youngster. So I think that's the other thing I would have told my 15 year old self is just be yourself and don't worry about growing up and assuming more responsibilities. Just be in that moment and just um, enjoy things as they are, really. Yeah. Thank you, Bree. And yourself, Nishi? Yeah, a, a very similar um, a scenario for myself to, to Preet. And I, and I would um, say to myself, uh, my 15-year-old my self is to really believe in yourself and, uh, you know, reach reach for the sky, you know, the, the sky's the limit. And, and uh, you know, don't be disheartened by um, career knock, knockbacks. I think um, look for role models, uh, but look for role models outside of what you're used to seeing. So, you know, um, don't be shy to kind of, you know, 
reach stretch yourself further and believe in yourself really and I know we all suffer from imposter syndrome we all um you know at all levels so it's important to kind of stay focused and if one door closes make sure you have your eye on on the next opportunity rather than just giving up and um you know going back in those stereotypical boxes of what an opportunity for you should look like what a career path for you uh, as a 15 year old should look like Okay, some really good pieces of advice there. And, you know, I just want to thank you both for your time. Um, it's been absolutely great speaking to you. And I really look forward to working with you both because I'm sure we will. Um, and I want to kind of wish you all the best um, for the rest of the day. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your kind of International Women's Day. No doubt you've got lots and lots of meetings and enjoyable things planned. So thank you both for your time. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for you. Bye now. Bye.